Hey guys, welcome back from lunch. Thank you for coming back into Jiffy. Uh, for those of you who aren't here yet, you aren't hearing me, but maybe later you'll watch this. So, tough crap. Watch it online. Anyway, next speaker up is Skylar Tanner. He is a returning speaker to the 21 convention. He spoke last year for the first time in Orlando, Florida, and now we're here in Austin, Texas, where he lives. Although he wasn't born here. He was born in California, I believe. Yeah. Sort of local Texan. His speech this year is titled Strength Training and the Biomarkers of Aging, which is a little bit different than I think it originally was. In all cases, it's going to be awesome. He is a general manager at Efficient Exercise, a good friend, a blogger at scholartanner.com, and a complete badass. Welcome, Scott Tanner, to the stage. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful. How y'all doing? Can I get a hell yeah? No, don't actually do that. No. No. All right, yeah, yeah. All right. Strength training and the biomarkers of aging. Um, biomarkers of aging are things that are. Uh, sometimes chemical, sometimes neural. They tell you how old you are and without having a chronological age tied to it. I'm going to tell you how you can use that in your life going forward. Uh, hopefully make you think about getting older and the changes that go on and how you can cut that off at the pass. I only have one piece of pickup advice here. I'm married. Being a pickup artist means I clean well, <laughs> stylishly around the house. Um, but it's right here. Hey, pretty, want a date? Yes, smile. No, backflip. Pretty good in theory. You might run into a problem if she's a gymnast. Uh, but I have a solution. Hit on cheerleaders. One in four shot. She's not going to make it. <laughs> not going to make it. And you're good. You're good. You're great. So it's the efficient exercise afternoon. And starting off on the far end of the phenotypic spectrum here is me. Keith is over here as the Far East Hercules. <laughs> we think of ourselves like this. You might see us maybe a little bit more like this here. Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. Duke Nukem. Shake it, baby. Um, but we hope we entertain and inform you. So why you should strength train is, you know, Y'all are young, filled with testosterone, like lifting heavy things. I shouldn't have to convince you too hard about why you should strength train. Uh, but I'll also tell you how it affects your bodies more than the plasticity of your muscle tissue. And then I'm going to teach you how to leverage diet to create biological immortality. Uh, that's probably the only time Marilyn Monroe ever actually lifted weights. She was normally lifting bottles of pills. Uh, why? Why? Why would you want to do these things? To live longer, to live healthier, and to benefit fully from your diet. Uh, strength training is the great leveraging agent. It is a force multiplier. If you eat like shit, it will minimize the damage that you are incurring on yourself. And if you eat pretty dang well, you're going to maximize whatever it is you're capable of getting as far as uh, health is concerned. This is Clarence Bass. He is 70 years old. And I think he owes the world some body fat at that uh, level of leanness. So what are the biomarkers? They are 10 determinants of aging that you are capable of controlling. Uh, they are things that tell you how old you would be if you didn't know how old you was. That's from the ageless Negro League pitcher here, Satchel Paige, who was a rookie at the age of 42. And he pitched for about 10 years and did exceptionally well. Uh, I modified the biomarkers a little bit because the original 10 included things like ability to regulate body temperature and, um, and basal metabolic rate. Pro tip, spoiler alert, strength training affects all those in a positive way. So when this book was originally written, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, it was 25 years ago, we didn't have the genetic technology to see what's going on at that small level. So I have added gene expression and telomere length to the things that we can affect. And of course, the big bonus is immortality through diet that I'll get to at the end of this talk. And I hope that's interesting to you all. You know, you should care because this is your birthright. Uh, and what I mean by that is that what is common is not normal. Uh, I'm also trying to figure out here if this is normal. You think, you would, you think you'd catch a little bit of, of, of his uh, junk there, but alas. Um, modern hunter-gatherers enjoy a lifespan of 72 years. Heart attacks and stroke, they appear rare. And degenerative deaths are largely few and confined to uh, early infancy, which is what skews the data. They all die when they're young. 
drags down the uh, modal age. So this is common in America, old men, small animals, busted legs. But what is normal is more of what we got here. Olga is 92 now. Um, she is a track champion, which, you know, at the age of 90 normally showing up means you win a medal. But her, her, um, her records are better than 10 to 12 years younger than she. And you gotta understand, it's not like our age, the difference between someone being 30 and, and someone being 20. It's, it's almost a, um, it's, it's vastly different in those 10 years compared to our 10 years. Ellsworth on the right here basically pioneered every uh, open heart surgeon, surgery technique that would be used on you today should you be so unfortunate to end up under the knife. And he was practicing until the age of 96. Uh, that's when he just let his license expire. He was normally the third surgeon at that point. So he could do everything, but it would scare the crap out of you if, if uh, Grandpa Plus showed up at the table and said, Error, I'm going to cut on you. So what I want you to think about here, because you're young, you're sprightly, you're cocksure, piss vinegar, I want you to try and imagine the future you. You can do this a couple ways. You could enter your face into a computer program that ages you. That's, that's actually pretty cool. Um, you know, you'd be the only person voluntarily doing that because most of the time you get it in those flyers in the mail that are sort of like, this child was abducted at three, here's what she would look like at 30. And, and you, you wonder why they're still looking. Uh, or, or the other thing is you can look at your parents. So one day after I spoke last year, I went, flew across the country to San Diego. This is my father. He has a wonderful walrus mustache. And you can start to see the similarities in, your no in the nose and the eyes. Uh, he just turned 60 a couple weeks ago. It was a lot of fun, uh, but you can see that, you know, when you're young, you're sort of like, I'm not going to be like my parents or I don't <laughs> resemble them. And then you get older and you start going, holy crap, I talk like them. I only tell stories like him. I answer the phone like, yellow, yeah, like he does. And, and it's not, it's ontological. It's arisen. It's just the way it is. Um, why would I want you to imagine the future you? Because if you interact with an older version of yourself, you have an increased tendency to save money. If you don't do that, you, you literally think you're a different person. It's this strange, bizarre, personal socialism kind of thing. Ah, someone else is going to take care of me when I'm 60. But like compound interest, a little bit today is going to compound to huge health benefits later in life. Uh, so consider that, that, you are, that your 60-year-old self is a continuation of you today. It will remember, it will remember aspects of this conference. It will remember that, that guy telling you you should think about your future self. It's the same lifespan. So with that in mind, we start with strength and muscle mass because that's what we care about at this age. Um, sarcopenia is a loss of muscle mass through aging. Uh, it's, it's an inactivity thing. It, most of it is not due to some sort of inbuilt genetic or phenotypic expression. Well, the phenotypic expression is you've been sitting on your ass, and that's why all the muscle went away, because that doesn't require much. Uh, muscle is required for strength. A loss of muscle means loss of strength. And it's the only thing that's independently associated with functional ability in the elderly. Uh, to put it another way, what good is having an amazing heart if you can't get out of your chair? Th this is, this is, the, is the ground in which every other function in your life arises from. And ba balance isn't a magical lump of wonder stuff here. Uh, you need muscle tissue and you need a sharp nervous system to enact those muscles in order to balance. And so when you lose muscle, the balance goes away as well. They're not separate things. They're part of the same spectrum. Uh, so to, to further drive this home with some science, this is going to be quite sciencey. You're going to see a lot of these references. I'm going to make it entertaining throughout. I'm going to put on my website the entire bibliography in case any of you are curious of what I'm referencing here. But in this particular 12-year study doing nothing, these individuals between 55 and 65 lose 20 to 30 percent of their strength just being sedentary. Um, and just a year of strength training increases strength by up to 29 percent in women and bone and mineral density in the hip and back. And if it does it in women, it's going to do it much better in, in men because we have a favorable hormone profile for this sort of thing. It doesn't mean women can't gain strength or muscle, clearly, but we do it even better. Um, and if these individuals, you know, through training, gain 28 percent and stop training, they will, this particular study, 12-week study, they gain 28% strength on average. If they stop training for 31 weeks, almost triple the amount of time they're training, they only lose half of what they gained. Uh, 
And so when you're talking about a, a program you can stick with for the, over the course of your life, people get hung up on doing enough, doing, doing enough, kind of a perfect program. Uh, the reality is, is that your body, for your body, muscle is expensive, very expensive, and it's not going to slosh it off willy-nilly. Uh, think about it like a corporation. If you train your muscle tissue, it becomes a highly paid VP. Um, if, if, it's, if you're sedentary, it's suddenly getting paid like a VP, but it's working like a mailroom uh, intern. So your body will get rid of it. You have to make that muscle important to your body, and that's what keeps it on. And so over the course of a lifetime, here's how this might look. This is out of a book, Bending the Aging Curve by Joseph Signorelli. If you train over the course of your life, by the time you get to 90, you'll have roughly the amount of muscle of an untrained 50-year-old. And if you perform an intervention later in life in middle age, you would still, at the age of 90, have the amount of muscle of an untrained 70-year-old. Again, those 20 years are way different than moving from the age of 20 to the age of 40 as far as functional ability is concerned. That is enormous. And um, they do this, they, they test this by pulling core samples of the quadricep muscles out of uh, individual's training and check the, um, they do some staining to determine fast switch motor units. And what tends to happen over the course of time as you get older, you get this atrophy fibrosis where uh, fast switch muscle fibers that don't get used, the, power, the powerhouses, the biggest, strongest motor units, uh, they revert irreversibly to, to connective tissue, and you can't get them back. So all, everything you need to be powerful to get you out of a chair, to move, to be quick, to climb a tree, to do whatever, it's not there, and you can't train to get it back. So that's why even if you train, you're still much worse off than someone who's been training their entire life because the demands to rebuild and turn over those fast switch motor units are there, always. Um, this is just a graph, right? And here's how it looks with MRI. So what you got here is a 40-year-old triathlete, slice MRI, look at that uh, wonderful ham steak, and you compare it to the 70-year-old triathlete, also the exact same ham steak. In fact, he might be a little leaner if you look at the outline of the fat mass here. Uh, and then you compare that to a seven, sedentary 74-year-old man. Uh, I mean, you just look at just how little bone mass he has, how there's all this intramuscular triglyceride going on, and these guys, it's very little. Uh, and so this was a survey study. Uh, these individuals said they trained three to five days a week. They didn't determine how they trained. Certainly not, uh, not entirely with weights. Uh, but if you look at weight training studies, even late in life, what you'll see is that 12 weeks on 92-year-old men, in this case, um, 12 weeks of resistance training increased the cross-sectional area uh, by about 44%. And that's in 92-year-olds. Um, and that's in a controlled environment. If you do something that's only, say, a B, on a scale of perfection of a, of a routine. It's not everything you can do, but it fits with your schedule. You won't ever have to have the perfect routine later in life. It's sort of like investing. Uh, you're gonna get this compound interest working for you over time so that you don't have to try and save for retirement at 60 because you screwed up all of your life by not doing what wasn't perfect, but was pretty dang good. Bone density. You wouldn't think this matters to men, uh, normally it doesn't, normally we're heavier, we work harder, but our increasingly sedentary lifestyles, we start to see osteoporosis in men. It's the loss of bone. Um, it's correlated with reduced function, frailty, um, and also Downer's hump is actually a series of microfractures in your, in your, lum in your uh, thoracic spine, gradually contributing to you rolling over. Strength has to go down to precede osteoporosis. If you are training, it's not just the loading of the skeletal tissue, but where the muscles connect to the bones, they work and those get stronger. So you're constantly stressing your bone. It's a symbiotic relationship. Um, you might have heard T-scores or bone density curves. Y'all are, most of you are young enough now that you're still below where bone would naturally level off. Uh, 35 to 40 in men. Up to that point, you can continue to add to your bone mass and push that ceiling up. By the time you get to that point, you max out, and all you can do for the rest of your life is maintain that level under the best of circumstances. It's another type of physiological headroom. Uh, so that is why, that's another reason why you should be training, because if you have this giant space of extra bone, it's not anything you'll ever have to worry about later in life. Um, you know, in women, again, uh, bone mineral density, strength, and muscle mass, elderly women, they all improve uh, with increases in physical activity. but Strength training improves not only the bone density, but you also, before the bone manifests, you see a blood marker in both men and women show up called osteocalcin. And it's a, researchers were confused to say, oh, is this something that tells us that 
um, they, they tend to happen in strength and or um, body mass index studies. And they say, oh, it, it seems to be that people with a good BMI exhibit a high number of this. But if you actually look at the data, it just means they're working hard enough. It's a blood marker that your bones are being stressed enough to grow. So you don't need to go and get bone density scans unless you're really paranoid about that or have that running in your family. So it has been shown to improve bone mineral density. But most studies are too short to show enough of, a, of an improvement, which would be 20%, to reduce the fracture from a fall. I mean, that's way off. But if you're stronger uh, and you have more muscle tissue, you're going to prevent the fall. You won't need to prevent the break. And uh, again, it doesn't take much to do that. Talk about body composition. Uh, fat mass in the abdominal region is the first step that leads to metabolic syndrome. Lean body mass shifts that profile away because adding body fat is basically turning you into women. It's, the fe it's a feminization process. The more fat you have, the testosterone to estrogen ratio starts to change. Um, and so what ends up happening, you know, it's associated with aging. Uh, and it also reduces the resting metabolic rate, which then proceeds to add even more body fat. And, you know, I talk about, you, know, you laugh, oh, it's feminizing. Well, it is. It's, I mean, the screen's bright, but you can see he's got a bit of gyno going on here. He's got this big, hard, pregnant belly. And uh, that is what we talk about when we talk about metabolic syndrome. It improves it in men and women where calories are controlled for and where they're not. So that's what I'm talking about with strength training is the force multiplier. It corrects all of your uh, dietary indiscretions to a large degree. Not entirely, but to a large degree. Um, and it reduces visceral adipose tissue. This is in and around the organs, insulates the organs, protects them from jarring, because you got to think, you're basically a cavity from the bottom of your rib cage to your pelvic floor. This doesn't expand very much. If you start to gain visceral adipose tissue, it's squeezing in on your organs, making them work harder to do the same stuff they would always be doing without an extra metabolic or biochemical benefit to you. They have to push out against it. And this is why skinny guys, ironically, slide aside, win eating contests, because fat mass doesn't stretch. It doesn't. We think about fat guys, oh, they can put down a lot of food. Their stomach is no different, and that fat isn't going to budge. So that's why your, um, your uh, tiny little ripped guys shove down 65 hot dogs, because they have room to expand. Your tissues don't have room and are getting internally crushed when you have a lot of visceral adipose tissue, which makes the heart work harder, which is why they call it heart attack fat. Let's talk about cardio. Or just look at the photo, whichever you'd like to do. There we go. We're going to call it cardiorespiratory training, sustained heart rate elevation through formal exercise, typically to increase VO2 max, lactate threshold, lactic acid threshold, lactate, ha ha ha, uh, or increase endurance. And uh, muscular, it does not increase muscular strength hypertrophy. It eats up muscle like you wouldn't believe. It's wonderful at that. Just nom, nom, nom on all that wonderful muscle tissue. It is not aerobics. Aerobics is an energy system. Because cardio can and does include anaerobic work. Think about sprinters. Think about the Usain Bolts of the world. 10 seconds is a long run. They're never really getting into the anaerobic system. Not directly. It's going to, or the aerobic system, excuse me, not directly. It's going to deal with substrate that comes down from the anaerobic system. But not, you're not living in it like a distance runner. And so with that in mind, we talk about cardiorespiratory training. We have to define health. According to World Health Organization, you can go ahead and read that, state of complete mental, physical, and social well-being. And it's not just the absence of disease. And the reason why I'm proceeding with this is because you talk to people about strength training. And they go, ah, but what about your heart? And then you go, OK, well, strength training does this for your heart. And they start moving the goalposts. They say, yeah, 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 but what about your blood lipids? OK, well, strength training affects that. I'll show you that. Yeah, 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 but what about blood pressure? Yeah, yeah, it does that too. Yeah, 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 but what about um, VO2 max and actual cardiac output performance? Yeah, it does that too. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to make you run a marathon or be ready to run a marathon, but it's going to improve the base to the point that you can launch off and be better than anybody else. Cardiometabolic health should coincidentally be considered. Um, and because you are more than your cardiorespiratory system when we talk about this, and here's what I mean, I showed you earlier Metabolic syndrome, the uh, gyno, the boobs on the man, the hard heart attack belly. That's also called Syndrome X. And it comes with all these other components, atherogenic dyslipidemia, abnormal cholesterol profile, hypertension, and impaired glucose control. Um, 
if you can train this musculoskeletal system, lift weights, strength train, it regulates the metabolism and reduces these factors without ever directly affecting the cardiovascular disease through formal training. You're not trying to train that, but it's a nice side benefit through controlling all of this, which is what muscle does so well. Blood lipids, atherogenic li dyslipidemia, these very loosely correlate. If you've heard Doug talk uh, a couple of years ago on the internet, he went into that just a little bit, touched on it. Mark Sisson touched on it a great deal in his talk from a couple of years ago. Um, but it's still something that people tend to focus on, and especially if you've got a cardio bunny, they'll harp on this again and again and again. Um, so it's assumed that resistance training is inferior. In my graduate program, all the people who are American College of, of Sports Medicine, they love their cardio, and they say, ah, resistance training does nothing for that. And all the NSCA guys who are all resistance training goes, of course it does. Those cardio guys don't know what they're talking about. And they just don't, they don't sit down and talk and actually share this information, apparently. Um, so as I said, this is not the case. So this particular meta-analysis, it had uh, 82 studies and 53 randomized controlled trials, found that moderate, moderate cardio doesn't influence lipid profile independent of exercise volume. It's, it doesn't do anything by itself until you get up to a very high level like you're training as an athlete. High intensity cardiorespiratory training, your sprints, your more anaerobic type bursts, improves HDL, but doesn't seem to affect anything else. And these positive effects of resistance training actually turn out to be the reduction of LDL. Um, so the problem with these studies, if there is a problem, is that most of the resistance training they use is, you know, you get untrained people and they're not able to actually heavily tax their, their aerobic, their cardiorespiratory system through strength training, as Keith will tell you, as Doug will tell you, as I will tell you, if you are good at what you do as a strength athlete, you will be heavily out of breath when you are done. And so, I don't have data, I don't have, don't have data or evidence for this, but I think you'll see with, with more advanced individuals, a reduction in the LDL and an increase in the HDL because of how hard they can work themselves and pull those two ends of the spectrum together. Uh, and in fact, there's, there are genotypic expressions as we start to talk about, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the differences to cardiorespiratory training, uh, I mean, it's the same thing with, with anything. You've got a buddy who barely works out, walks through a gym, blows up with muscle. There are some that jog a little bit and they have just rock bottom, uh, their, their cholesterol just drops like a rock. And so in this particular uh, study, they found a gen genotype called the apo apolipoprotein E type that doesn't matter what it is, but the point is that they were hyper responders two or three times more reduction in cholesterol from the same amount of cardiovascular activity. Um, and so with that in mind, there's no evidence for this again, but I would not be surprised if there's a similar genotype for strength trainees. Huge improvements uh, with the same amount of volume. Hemodynamics, this is where people start to talk about the heart, not just things floating in the blood. Um, hypertension, it's a persistent resting increase in blood pressure. By the age of 60 to 70, you're talking about 50% of everybody. But by the time of 85, this risk drops off. It doesn't matter the blood pressure. It doesn't increase your risk of death. You still want to control it um, so it doesn't kill you before you get to 85. So here's how that might look. You've seen it in people. They're really red. They're puffy. He's also got metabolic syndrome going on here. Um, and you can just see it. In the people, you can see the veins kind of bursting in their nose. That's always one of the signs of high blood pressure, these smaller arterioles bursting. Uh, it has a respectable track record in this regard, that resistance training. So these two guys found that uh, 3.2 tor, that's what the millimeters per, per uh, mercury of mercury change is. That's your systolic blood pressure. That's your heart pumping blood out to the rest of your body. 3.5 tor decrease in diastolic blood pressure there are some blood pressure medications that would be happy for you to get that, that sort of improvement. Uh, so you got further positive results in this regard, including reducing uh, resting blood pressure in 65 to 73 year olds with high normal blood pressure. Strength training doesn't seem to work on the people with really, really bad hypertension, or at least not enough to bring them into a safer range. Um, and that's also a reason why I talk about doing this before it's an intervention, doing this when you're healthy so you can keep yourself exactly as you are. Uh, but as a matter of fact, aerobics, cardiorespiratory training doesn't have that much of a track record in that regard either. That's why they bring out the big guns, the big drugs typically. Uh, 
So one of the things that you got to understand that as a trainer, or if you're trying to work on your health, you have to think about, we're kind of like swim coaches in this sense, right? Trainers, nutritionists, uh, guys like Dave, Doug, Keith, in that we're trying to teach you how to swim. We are trying to teach you how to thrive, swim faster, swim better. Doctors, they are lifeguards. They're pulling your head up from under the water, but they can't teach you how to paddle, right? So I have a client who's a, he's a uh, cardiologist, and I'll start talking about these things, and we're on opposite ends of this curve. And he goes, you got to understand, when people get to me, they don't have a pulse most of the time, or they, they have, you know, they've already had multiple heart attacks. And so he, all he studies is pathology. Um, and so what tends to happen is the things you might see in patholo pathological conditions will, might show up in healthy individuals, but it poses no problem whatsoever. Um, they're, they're, it's a different ball game, but doctors will get concerned. I get it. They only see nearly dead people. Um, so in this case, arterial compliance is just like it sounds. It's like, the, it's like the Austonian. That's the tallest building in Austin. When an artery is compliant, changes in blood pressure do not make it burst or rupture. It bends rather than breaks. Buildings are meant to sway in the wind. If they were stiff, they would crack. They would fail. Arterial compliance is what you want in that regard. Um, and so that when you strength train, you actually have slightly reduced arterial compliance. I'll, I'll get to why that's not always the case, but it shows up pretty regularly. And it's, and it's not associated with impaired vasoreactivity, which is how quickly your vascular system adjusts to the demands. If you're sick and you have, a sti if you have arterial stiffening, you don't react quickly. But if you're well, you do continue to react quickly when you are exposed to some sort of sympathetic stimulus. This is... Um, Something that's going to raise your heart rate, raise your blood pressure. Think of a caffeine as a sympathetic stimulus. Um, or endothelial function is not, is not adversely affected. And in this increase in arterial stiffening also comes with an increase in vasodilatory capacity. So your, your, your vascular system is a closed hydraulic system. You're not really adding much in the way of fluid coming or going. You get a little bit of water changing uh, on a regular basis but not much. So if you can dilate that system just a little bit, blood pressure drops like a rock. And high, high intensity exercise dilates that like nobody's business. Whereas the guy who's plodding along, hunched over on the side of the road jogging, thinking he's doing a good thing, doesn't get enough of that stimulus to dilate the vascular system. So his heart's pumping 1,000 miles an hour because he can't move as much blood per stroke. I'll, I'll get to a little bit more of that here in a second. Um, but if you get to some cardiorespiratory training, like I said, it decreases that arterial stiffening, but it doesn't dilate like resistance training does. They both lower your blood pressure. And more recent studies have actually found that in premenopausal women, again, if it works in premenopausal women, it's probably going to work with men because they are the giantest pain in the ass in the research world. If you can get something to work on them, you can get something to work anywhere. Um, it's just the way it is, especially if you're in decent shape. They didn't have any arterial compliance in, uh, due to weight training. So that's all confusing. It's a lot going on there. Let me try and simplify it here for you. This is green. This is red. This is yellow. So they both reduce blood pressure. Strength training increases arterial stiffening, whereas aerobics decreases it. The aerobics has a much smaller increase in vasodilation, and it's only once the threshold of intensity is met, whereas we get a lot over here from the strength training. And in premenopausal women, again, we don't get arterial stiffening. So it got me thinking. Um, <laughs> laugh it up, fuzzballs. Come on. <laughs> um, Star Wars reference, anybody? Anyway. Um, so maybe, maybe this is due to different hemodynamic effects that strength training experiences. It's kind of like uh, there's a, a guy in the kind of primal community, a guy named um, Kurt Harris, and he talks about how the blood markers you see for a paleo diet do not necessarily reflect health and due to a paleo diet or in the context of a paleo primal ancestral diet um, that the blood markers we see as healthy might not be healthy but we associate them with health because the only set of blood markers we've ever seen is in agrarian feeding slightly unhealthy quite inflamed individuals does that make sense does everybody understand what i just said there okay okay so it got me thinking if there might be a study that's actually directly measuring what's going on during strength training on people who might be problematic. 
Hey, there is. What do you know? Um, in this study, Patrick doesn't have chronic congestive heart failure here, but in this particular study, patients with chronic congestive heart failure, they uh, found a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. So what they did was chronic congestive heart failure is the inability of your heart to supply your body with a sufficient amount of blood. And what happens is that they put these individuals on a leg press, they inserted a central catheter to measure exactly what's going on on a moment by moment basis. Most of the time you're getting these distal measures, not direct measures. Um, and what they found was that at the highest intensities on a leg press, over 80% of their one rep max, these individuals, the higher the intensity went up to, I, I don't think they went all the way to 90, uh, but the higher they went, the more and more the vascular system opened up and allowed for this blood flow to occur this in part is because in order for the heart, again it's a closed hydraulic system, to pump, it has to be getting blood back. So the way this works is that your left ventricle, the largest, pumps it out and it comes back to the uh, right, aorta, right aorta, which then moves the blood into the right ventricle, which pumps it through your lungs, and then back into the left aorta, which moves into the right, or in the left ventricle, back to move out to your body. That's why the left is larger. It's got to move the blood a larger distance rather than just sort of front and back in your body. Um, and so what happens is with these smooth, controlled contractions of a leg press, because if you're running, it's choppy, chop, 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 you're getting the muscles actually constricting on the vascular system and shortening the amount of blood that's moved each repetition. Because if you think about running, it's a series of repetitions. More, more smooth, heavy, heavy effort leg press is pumping huge amounts of blood back to the heart so it's more efficient. And so if you don't have to pump very fast, if your rate of filling is smooth and consistent, you don't have to be constantly adjusting to these changes in uh, pressure. That's why strength training shows a slight increase in arterial stiffening but a reduction in, um, or an increase in vasodilation and reduction in blood pressure while working. On people with heart failure, you guys, you just need to work out hard leg press and your heart's going to be in great shape. But I have more. Because when we talk about the heart and the health of cardiovascular system, blood glucose control matters a lot. Um, it's the most important manifestation of that syndrome X, metabolic syndrome. Uh, and if you can control glucose, you reduce the risk of any cardiovascular disease event by 42%. Um, and Strength training drains glucose like you wouldn't believe. Two sets of 10, if we're going to talk in set terminology, uses about five grams of intramuscular, uh, of glucose. Yeah, make, keep it simple, carbohydrate. Uh, so a workout might use 35 to 60 grams of carbohydrates, depending on how long it is, with weights. It's not nearly as aggressively draining those muscle tissues with a cardiorespiratory type training. And the thing is about your muscles is they do not like losing any glycogen at all. So there's a process called supercompensation. When you drain them, they make room for more glycogen to be stored. So if you're constantly somewhat emptying the tank, you always create a headroom to take on any amount of glucose or not any. There's a limit. It's something to the effect of 1,200 uh, grams for a 180-pound person is about the maximum amount of intramuscular glycogen and only for short periods of time and only after fully unloaded tissue. You're talking about endurance athletes, big time. Your average person, maybe it's about 500 grams. Um, but if you're constantly pulling out of this bank and then reinvesting, pulling out and reinvesting, your body makes room for more of this. So you don't have to ever have abnormal blood glucose levels because it always has somewhere to go. Um, and so here's an example of that. Isochloric amount of treadmill exercise did not match the amount of glycemic control of 10 weeks of resistance training. They controlled for calories. They did not get as good a result. Um, and HbA1c is a measure of basically the last 120 days of blood sugar levels. Measure something called glycated, uh, it's glycated hemoglobin. Uh, so it's a feasible treatment for the diabetic population at large because if you can reduce it to a clinically significant degree, you know, you're as good as a drug at that point. So, what happens here is that <laughs> traditionally you have, um, you, you have 
this increase in diabetes, you know, the supersize me of the world trying to blame McDonald's for their poor parenting decisions, um, making their kids diabetic, youth type 2 diabetes levels enormously high. It used to be called adult onset diabetes or diabetes. <laughs> Liberty Medical is not sponsoring this presentation. <laughs> Has anyone watched Cocoon recently? <laughs> um, so, but the point is that it only used to affect adults because they would get less muscle mass, they would have less room for the glucose, the cells would shut it off to protect themselves because your cells don't like having uh, glycated proteins hanging out in the cytosol, and that blood sugar would have nowhere to go. Um, now it's showing up in kids. Let's look at, look at uh, the Michelin boy here. Um, it's showing up in kids because they're just being hammered with severe amounts of carbohydrates. Um, anyway. So in conclusion, I mean, it, this sums it up so well here, this particular study. It is clinically and statistically significant effect on metabolic syndrome, lowers all of these wonderful risk factors, and it should be the measure or the, the marker in which all other treatments are measured when it comes to controlling type 2 diabetes and metabolic disorders. And in fact, in Australia, they have started prescribing exercise for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, weight training specifically for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Um, and I wonder if there's just some sort of a medical, legal uh, truce there <coughs> that understands that the doctor is trying to get the best results for their patient combined with a personal responsibility. Because here in America, as Doug will tell you, Dr. Doug McGuff, uh, when your balls are on the chopping block, you will prescribe walking because nobody is going to attempt to sue you. Well, they might attempt to sue you for walking, but we're bipedal. You know, it's, it'll be thrown out of court. Uh, so that suddenly becomes exercise rather than, damn it, you're a human being. You should be able to stand on two feet, create locomotion moving forward. So it's great. It's fantastic stuff in that regard. And so we talk about aerobic capacity. A lot of stuff I know. I'm trying to keep it fun. That's why Michelin Boy was there. Cardiorespiratory training, improvements in cardiovascular fitness. Uh, some people, you know, strength training is a little controversial in this way. Typically, it's assessed by a treadmill test, um, and it's an important risk factor in all-cause mortality. Now, should any of you be in a situation where you have to take a treadmill test for insurance? I have a suggestion. Practice the treadmill test the month prior to doing that. You will score so much better in spite of the fact that you have not gotten fitter because there's a skill component involved in constantly adapting to the increasing... Um, levels of the treadmill. When you do a treadmill test, every three minutes they're increasing the height of the treadmill, the grade and the speed typically. Uh, if you practice that, you're much better at, as a result. So mortality and comorbidity, uh, they're associated with coronary heart disease in men and women um, in this particular treadmill test and all-cause mortality. And high levels of physical fitness delay this mostly because of that lowered rate of cardiovascular disease. Right? So you know, you, you go on Google and you search heart attack. This guy's showing up in some memes. Am I the only one who thinks that this isn't a heart attack, but possibly an O-face? <laughs> What's going on down here? It depends. What's going on down here? And I, I do like his old, uh, his old receipt machine here as well. That's always a good time. So that's what we're talking about. If we're talking about aerobic capacity to a certain extent, we're also talking about um, heart attack prevention, VO2 max, things of that nature. So in this particular study, uh, treadmill walking endurance increases 80%, or I'm sorry, increases 38% and 80% of VO2 max in these elderly individuals, even though VO2 max does not change. VO2 max is a monopoly money measure of uh, how much oxygen you can consume and use at the muscle tissue level. Uh, the thing is, is that you can increase your endurance without increasing your VO2 max. It's mostly set by genetics, and so people for a while there, once they figured out, ah, VO2 max, let's drive this thing to the moon. You don't get much more than 20% training for it specifically above your genetic level. And that doesn't mean that you're gonna suddenly be some sort of world champion athlete. You have marathon champions between 60 VO2 and 90 VO2. Um, so it's an interesting measure that doesn't mean anything. But if you're going to argue with someone and they were, their, term, their only term is VO2 max, now you've got something to say like, hey, buddy, I can argue with you on that and show you that strength training, and on top of making you look better naked, made your ticker better as well, even in their arena of choice. So 12 weeks of high-intensity strength training increases VO2 max by an average of 1.9 milliliters per kilogram per minute. You see why it's a bit of monopoly money. You can move your weight up and down. 
Um, in my case, this would be about a 5% increase. My VO2 max is 47 without doing any cardio. Um, in order to be at the elite level, according to, to the list that they put out there, you have to be at 50. So that's not bad, training 13 minutes once a week. Um, and they did it in 72-year-old men. And again, I talked about the compromise with aging in the heart earlier. Uh, biopsy showed a 15% increase in capillary density and 38% increase in citrate synthase activity. Capillary density is typically only seen increases in this. It's the amount of um, it's the amount of artery of uh, arterioles feeding the muscle tissue directly, supplying the blood into them. Normally, what happens when you strength train is that your muscles get bigger, and you see a reduction in that capillary density because the, uh, the volume of those capillaries has stayed the same. You still get just as much blood into the muscle tissue. Uh, of course, this doesn't matter, as what I told you earlier, because you're more efficient. So you don't need more capillaries if you can move more blood through them. The other thing here is that citrate synthase. I want you all to go back to high school biology, chemistry, physiology. It shows up in all of these. Is a rate-limiting step, is the rate-limiting step in the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle. So acetyl-CoA is a substrate that, gly that glucose, glycogen, fat, and protein can all move into and become in the body that passes into the cell. And the first thing it has to be acted upon is citrate synthase before it becomes citrate and starts moving around and throwing off ATP like mad. If you can increase this rate limiting step by 38%, you can deal with more substrate coming down. You are a more aerobic animal without doing any aerobics because we're just a bag of chemical reactions. So if you can get these rate limiting steps bumped up, you can run with your friends, sprint past them, and keep going without ever doing any cardio. I think you would have something better to do than go jogging with your friends, of course. So an expansive review of depth and breadth of adaptations has been published by 21 Convention alumni James Steele, Deuce. There's actually a James Steele III, if you accidentally type in three eyes. Um, and uh, Doug McGuff, magical deity, I mean, medical doctor. Um, <laughs> Stole that from, uh, actually, actually, Doug's got a great story. He's, he's been writing articles and things for years and years and years, and he had this one talking about sort of bringing doctors back down to earth. And he said two things. He said, MD does not mean magical deity. And you might think being a doctor is a great job, and it's hugely rewarding in a number of ways. But how many of you have to stick your finger in a sphincter on a daily basis? <laughs> That's why they pay him the big bucks. I'm sure you could privatize that, too. I'm sure there's got to be a way to privatize the sphincter poke. <laughs> Gene expression defined. Hey, here we are. It's the conversion of information into messenger RNA from the gene. And then it becomes the phenotypic mani manifestation of the gene. Uh, genes are knobs and switches that are influenced by the way you live. They are not genetic destiny. Uh, except for talk sounding exactly like your father years later. Uh, if I simplify that, it's the building blocks that make you, you, in, via environmental influences. And again, this is called your phenotype. You, your genes are going to determine how tall you are, the max amount of muscle tissue you can have, the max amount of VO2 max. But that's a giant range in which you can operate under and make improvements in. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, Gattaca. Lots of G's, A's, T's, and C's, and that's your gene being expressed through messenger RNA in result to input from the outside world. Uh, so you've got all of these genes associated with aging corresponding with mitochondrial dysfunctions, the powerhouse of the cell. Um, if you run out of power, the, you know, if you can't metabolically continue to support that cell, it's going to die. There are some immortal cells, uh, but this, in, in a general sense, is what we're talking about with mitochondrial dysfunction. Muscle atrophy and dysfunction, they associate together, and they might be causally related. That's science you speak. They are causally related, but in studies you have to say might be causally related. Uh, gene expression is blunted or eliminated with inactivity, the youthful gene expression, even in the early stages of a resistance training intervention. When you walk in, if you've never trained before, whether you're 20 or you're 70, um, you cannot access your biggest, strongest motor units. Your central nervous system does not know how to make these muscles contract to its maximum voluntarily. 
And uh, that actually might be what makes Olympians better than the laypersons is that they can do that better than anyone else. They can use the breadth of their muscle tissue from day one. But if you use this as an intervention late in life, initially you can't get to those fast switch fibers. And even then, as I explained earlier, some of them have turned irreversibly to connective tissue. Um, so in this particular study, they showed that strength training in the elderly reversed oxidative stress and returned gene expression in 179 genes to a youthful level. Move them back about 10 years. Let me, let me repeat that. The genes got 10 years younger. That's impressive. Here's how it looks. These black lines were all the genes expressed either downregulated or upregulated in these elderly populations. And after training, they moved closer to that line. That's flat. If I make that three-dimensional, give you an x and a y axis, or not three-dimensional, an x and a y axis, you see this black line here is a youthful gene expression. And these twin peaks are the genes moving back to center. So at the start of the study, these peaks would have been out here. They would have been way off on the ends, and they shifted in. That's pretty staggering stuff. You just, you just anti-aged. You just reversed aging by 10 years. And it wasn't a Clairol night cream for the crow's eyes either, promising that stuff. Telomeres, 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 telomeres. They are regions at the end of your chromosomes that protect the gene. Uh, because through replication, the gene is exposed to damage, and they help to reduce that. And if they divided without the telomeres, they would lose the ends of the chromosomes and the information they contain. So these caps, these little tiny helmets are there. Um, and they, that's what they protect the gene to continue to either not recreate out of control, cancer, or become so short that you're eroding genetic information. But aging does that. Telomeres are your protection. They're your shield. You want that strong. So regular physical activity it was sought to reduce telomere length, which is actually true in endurance athletes. So, you know, endurance activities are going to kill you. If you still want to do them, good luck to you, but don't sell them as a healthcare intervention. Things are different with regards to strength training. Not entirely, but I'll get to that. In this particular study, power lifters had a longer mean and minimum telomere compared to sedentary men, except for the strongest in the squat and the deadlift. The guys who were the strongest had the smallest telomeres, even though they were better than the sedentary population. And so talking about this, when you train, you're recruiting satellite cells for regenerative events. Um, that shows improvements in the telomeres. But if you can't, don't give those satellite cells enough time to fully recover the tissues that you've acted upon, you are short-circuiting this process. And based on this data, what I think is happening is that these guys who are really, 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 really strong are the hyper-responders. And so they, on a muscle plasticity level, get stronger, stronger, stronger living in the gym. But at a genetic level, they're actually short-circuiting the way in which their cells grow and change. Can't prove it, but these two seem to suggest that. Um, and so in this case, stress is also involved. The active individuals with the lowest amount of stress have the um, longest telomeres. Strength training is a stressor. Too much of it is going to shorten the telomeres. And these guys like training. They really like training. That's going to reduce the length of their telomere because they're living in the gym. So here's some hormones and some protein. I'm sorry, some proteins that are involved in this. mTOR is typically antagonistic of AMPK. You see increases AMPK in endurance, cardio uh, respiratory training. mTOR goes up with strength training. Um, and they regulate cellular aging genes. And so in order to restore the length of the telomere, you need telomerase that keeps that going. So if you alter AMPK levels, you improve the telomerase output, which increases the repair of the telomere. You don't get that being sedentary. That actually drops off fairly substantially. So there's no doubt there's a link. Now we're on to the biological immortality. This is Michael Rose. This is not Ira Glass. Of, um, uh, he's an evolutionary biologist at the University of UCAL Irvine. Uh, strangely enough, he and Art Devaney both, if you're familiar with who Art Devaney is, they're both there. They never interacted. That's problematic. Humanities, we'll never see the social sciences, we'll never see the natural sciences, liberal arts. They all stay away from one another, unfortunately. 
First, what bio biological immortality is not, it's not Greek-like immortality, or to put it another way, one does not simply stop aging. <laughs> if we define biological, or sort of biological mortality, it's the changes in the structure and functions of humans with the passage of time that does not result from disease or gross accidents. Read that? Everyone good? So if right conditions, you can live indefinitely, but if you can be rescued from biochemical, cellular, and physical accidents that befall us. It's a betrayal of your own body in a supposedly ideal environment. It happens at every level, at the genome, in the cells, the way the organs fit together, and at tissues. Natural selection starts giving a damn. Your body is pretty damn good at getting you to childbirthing years. And then after that, everything goes to hell in a handbasket if you're not taking care of yourself. That's why it's a tragedy when a 45-year-old gets cancer, but it's not unexpected. It is a heinous tragedy when a nine-year-old gets cancer because they shouldn't, and this is the reason why. Natural selection is pretty good about getting you there, um, but it's not perfect. So if you can go backwards in terms of evolutionary time, diet and environment, you're, you're doing better off here. Uh, this doesn't mean, you know, hitting your wife or girlfriend over the head with a club, dragging them by their hair, that type of stuff. Um, we're talking diet. We're trying to mimic a physiological state like that of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. So you're talking about these are very poor over the age of 35, grains, grasses, milk. Um, as I said, your child, I mean, all of you, gosh, think about going through puberty. You'd sort of like frozen macaroni, eating it frozen. It didn't matter. I grew up watching infomercials on Sunday morning. I would take an entire tub of cream cheese and eat it with pretzel sticks, right? Your, it doesn't body doesn't no matter. Calories, growth, great. You know, it'll do it. It'll do it. But when you get old, your body is, you're not turning over tissue nearly as quickly. Things are going awry. You, you need to give it some support. The problem is the industrial part. High sugar, high processed, highly advertised Twinkies. Problem is agriculture, you know, 35 to 40. Rice, grain, corn, they're very, very novel. Um, because it takes about a million years to adapt fully. So in a million years, we will be agriculturally adapted. None of us in this room are going to get there. But we might, as a human race, be there. So that's why Egypt, Iraq, East Asia, they're better suited. And, you know, honkies like me, that's why, we, that's why we're good with milk. Northern Europeans, great with milk, bad with grains, relatively great with milk. Uh, you know, nobody today will get there. And they're going to show up in middle age because of that natural selection. So what are we talking about here, other than the banana-crazed monkey here? Uh, lots of evidence from 4 million to 1 million years. We ate roots with fruits, nuts, and berries, just like primates. And then we take the gamble. We come down from the trees. We reduce the size of our stomach. Our brain gets bigger. We need more calories. So you get like Captain Orangutan here, spear fishing, and you thought we came up with it. Um, <laughs> common ancestor figured out, ah, and that's, that's the end of it. That's a pretty cool little photo there. Take up hunting, supplementing with the fruits, nuts, and berries, and most hunter-gatherer populations still support their animal intake this way. Why is this familiar? Malibu Mark Sisson says so. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, a whole bunch of other people as well. But the point is, is that it's not that far off. And if you can move closer to this or to what Dave is going to tell you about with uh, tomorrow with his uh, dietary recommendations, you're going to be way better off moving much closer to biological immortality. And I want you to understand, too, it's a fool's errand to attempt to prove one complete diet over another is healthier. And I underline, underscore, circle, complete, meaning all the essential nutrients are present and accounted for. Because then you get people saying, ah, three more grams of starch will kill you. Rather, I would suggest that you look to see which has the lowest potential anti-health agents and adjust to that. I'm a facts and evidence guy. That's the thing that makes sense to me. You don't, those are the things that are going to kill you. Once you're to a level of health, uh, as I defined earlier, you, Im you improve your functional capability with the strength training. Right? So to review, I told you why you should strength train how it affects your body systems, and how to leverage your diet to create this biological immortality. They all fit together. To simplify that entire presentation, three points. Train, but do not overtrain with weights, and this takes care of everything. You avoid your stress, you know, 
It's everything will figure itself out over time. And you eat the way Mark Sisson told you to. <laughs> or close to it, pretty much. That's all, guys. Any questions? Got Mike. Yeah, I'll start. Steve, how you doing, bud? All right. Hey, I number one, I uh, I'm a big fan of what you guys do. I've worked out with you guys and think you guys have the best personal training, uh, whatever we have trainers that and setup ever. But uh, what what I also wanted to know is uh, this was a really gr great speech for a lot of reasons. I want to know about some of the cardio stuff or the, the heart condition stuff because I've always had high blood pressure. My heart rate is 50 resting. I'm in good shape. Um, uh, my diet, I, because of watching you guys, I'm on closer to a paleo diet. Uh, what, I guess, is the, and you talked about this, but directly exercise-wise, what is it that I should be doing that will have a direct result on that? Because I've tried so many things. I totally hate taking medication. It messes up my mood and, and uh, my motivation and all that sort of stuff. Um, are you high normal? Are you, are you, you, are you? Oh no, man, it's high. I mean, like it's, it's been really high at times since I got, I, I used to be really out of shape, but since I got in better shape, it lowered. But we're talking like 145 over 95 to 100 at times. And uh, it shouldn't, I'm 34, almost 35, so it shouldn't be there. No, it, sh it shouldn't be there, and I know that, you're, are you, that, that you train with us, so that normally takes care of everything. Um, and it, <laughs> so what's No, no, happening? but what I mean, but let me, let me, let me quantify that statement a little bit. Normally it takes care of everything. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, it, typically we're going to see these things come in, and then if a person needs more, if all these markers improve but there's one sticking out like a sore thumb, it might not mean anything in the context of the patient sitting in front of the doctor rather than markers on a piece of paper. Um, or it might be that, you know what, we got to medication for a reason. The naturopathic doctors like to wank about like we just somehow jumped from being these healthy, peace-loving individuals to industrialized medicine. But you know what? Turmeric stops working after a little while. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, when we talk about, you have to go to cortisone, right? And so it might be that as much as you hate taking medication, I mean, you know, your doctor would be better. You know, I'm not a medical practitioner. Uh, but it, if he might look at you and go, you know what, everything else is great, mm, you might not need anything. Uh, that's, that's outside the scope of, you know, if you're resting blood pressure or resting heart rate's low, you know, when you train, your heart rate doesn't go through the roof and, you know, goes high, but not to, you know, run away sort of tacky. Yeah, I, I, beyond that, I'm, talk to Doug. <laughs> um, well, I, yeah, sorry, just really quick. Uh, like that, but that's question. the problem is medical doctors always jump to this like conclusion of you have to do this. And I'm wondering if it's healthy or not because I find a DO. I'm I'm saying this nicely. Find find a DO. They get more training and they're paid less. So they care about their patient because they want to keep them around. I'm serious. It, it, it's true. I mean, they get the same training plus more. And they're paid less because in America we only look at MD, magical deity. I figure out what DO could be. It would be, it would be bad. I don't know. I'll figure it out later. Um, one more question. This guy right here. We're bringing around the mic. Uh, I was reading Doug McGuff's book, and he talks a lot about how running a mile. <clears throat> sorry, uh, running a mile and walking a mile, you burn roughly the same amount of calories. Uh, can you explain why that is? It's not entirely true, actually. It's one of the studies we did in my, sorry, Doug, time to crap all over you. Uh, that's not entirely true, but I'll qualify that a little bit more. Um, the amount of calories you burn on a given distance is mostly determined by weight. And so you can run a mile with horrible, at a slow speed and horrible mechanics, and you're going to work harder. Um, but nears makes no difference, it's the same. If you're heavier, you're gonna burn more. If you're lighter, you're gonna burn less. It's a narrow window. So, you know, technically, you burn more calories running that mile. But are you gonna decide about 15 calories? I'm not. That's three sticks of sugar-free gum, for goodness sakes. I mean, you know, uh, it, that, that's, that's nothing to get, uh, your body, it doesn't do accounting like that. So, 
you know, I like walking. I got in an argument once with uh, this woman who runs the newspaper. I sent in, she was talking for Fit Austinites, and I explained to her I train, you know, about once every five days with weights, 13 minutes a pop. Um, and the rest of the time I just, you know, relax. I'm working on my feet training people. She goes, well, you must do more. You must do more. I go and walk my dogs a mile, you know, but I'm bipedal. That sh that's not a work. It's not a workout. And she goes, walking's a great form of exercise. And that should tell you right there what the problem is with when we think walking's a great form of exercise. And she left off with this. I don't want people thinking they can get fit lying around on the couch all week. You know, because that's exactly what I said. But you can, I do, you know? I mean, it, it's just, just, I sleep and I work out once a week and I hibernate and it's great. No, uh, you know, the, the point is, is that if you're in good shape, you might want to go do that and it's fun for you. But don't get too, don't get too obsessive about 15 calories walking or running that mile. Yeah, there we go. That's it, guys. Thank you.